Healthy parks, healthy people, healthy planet all go together. Cannot have one without the other. We can't have human health ultimately without a healthy planet, healthy parks, healthy ecosystem. Seafood is the most sourced animal-based protein in the world, more than pork, more than poultry, more than beef. And about a billion of us depend on seafood um, for their only source of protein. Um, we have gone through about a third of all of our fishery stocks in the open ocean. And some scientists think that by the year 2050, we'll go through the rest. So essentially, in 40 years from now, we won't have um, wild-caught open ocean fish in our menu, in our diet anymore. It's really astounding, maybe in my lifetime, certainly in my daughter's lifetime. That parks are more than parks. Uh, parks are not only a source of health, uh, by connecting people to the natural world and to their own bodies. Uh, but parks are the potential infrastructure, one of the most important uh, potential infrastructure uh, for a movement that will connect people to nature. Unless we have that movement, uh, we will not get to the place where we can deal uh, seriously with the major environmental uh, problems. This um, argument that we depend on the natural world for our well-being transcends other challenges to social change issues. So it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, your religious beliefs, your pit political ideologies. Everyone, everywhere, cares about their health and the health of their children. Uh, to me, I think uh, healthy parks, healthy people means a, a whole new way of looking at how parks and protected areas can engage with people, uh, not only in rural areas, where of course most parks are, but they're also a crucial thing for uh, cities. And most of us these days, we live in cities and pretty well disconnected from nature. So I think it's a, a new chapter in the history of protected areas. I guess my special area, and my, my special plea does concern that biodiversity aspects of our parks. Some parks, I'm sure, are good recreation areas, great places for people just to go and enjoy a bit of green space. They can also be the place where we connect at a very deep level with our life support system on Earth. And I think that if we get that right, we'll rise to this challenge of seeing a, a sustainable future where we do have a truly healthy population truly healthy parks and truly healthy planet as a whole. Custodians of the planet, as we understand the impacts that we're having, um, land ownership starts becoming completely irrelevant and what becomes relevant is land use. So it doesn't matter whether it's owned by the state or by local communities or by the private sector. The way that land is managed and used is what's critically important for all of our futures. So that landscape connectivity for me is one of the futures of, of all of us. If we don't get that interaction right, um, all of our futures are going to be jeopardised. According to the CSIRO here, we spend 90% of our lives indoors, 7% of our lives in cars, and only 3% of our lives outdoors. So we're often inactive, increasingly glued to a chair or a couch, and out of touch with the natural world around us. The evidence shows that there's a direct relationship between being outdoors and being active in children. So if you're not outdoors, you're not active. The natural environment can enrich a childhood. It can fulfill adults and it helps with healthy aging. Notice the healthy aging starts in the 30s. It probably starts even before that. Physical activity is as good as antidepressants. It's in early evidence, A-class evidence, and yet it's not being used. We can help them from the environment to say to people with mild to moderate depression, before you go on drugs, let's try physical activity. Let's try being outdoors where we know the stress is reduced. And the best way of getting back to your roots is open the door and walk outside. <laughs> We're losing contact with what we are, which are partners in this planet. And if we isolate our society from the planet itself, there's no way we're going to be able to read what the planet's telling us and what needs to be done. So for me, we live in extremely exciting times. We, the generation that has a chance to make a real difference to the future. We've destroyed about a quarter of all coral reefs. Um, you guys know this story very well here in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. With increased stresses, we're seeing of climate change, of pollution, we're seeing much more disease. We're seeing new diseases that have never been seen before. 
Um, and so the story that we tell in our work is that we may be losing medicines and other contributions to our health and well-being before we've even discovered them. I think we have to come together as a global community. I think we have a shared responsibility to act globally um, and we're not seeing that. It seems like you're seeing many parts of the world or many communities are, are disconnecting their responsibility to act collectively to promote national parks, to promote protected areas or wilderness. You see the, the, the value that these wilderness areas, these protected areas have on social well-being, on the people, on the, the communities. You know, in all the talk about the climate crisis, we hear a lot about technology and we hear a lot about policy, but we don't hear much about community. Community is the key missing ingredient in that uh, combined effort to combat the toughest problems that we face today, and green space is key to community. This is one of our greatest accomplishments, the Eco Ranger Club. When we started our program in 2003, we were actually chased out of the park. Machete guns, machetes, Molotov cocktails, angry villagers, former Khmer Rouge guerrillas. Again, we were disconnected. Today, 2010, these former poachers, former Guerrilla Rouge commanders, are sending their kids not only to the schools, but to these voluntary eco-ranger clubs where they're actively learning about conservation, forest management, national parks, community service, community volunteering. You are seeing the mind change. You're seeing this paradigm shift that we were hoping for in 2003. Um, I feel that in the modern world we've disconnected from nature quite a lot. You drive to work in your air-conditioned car and go to your air-conditioned office and don't even have to look at the weather. Uh, how far removed from nature is that? Your every day you don't have to even be concerned with. So I think if the human society can actually regain its connection to nature because we are part of nature, then we, we actually improve a lot of social problems, we actually improve a lot of environmental problems. So just that basic connection of being in nature the greatest gift that these economies like Australia can give to developing economies is their shared knowledge on how to actually build healthy parks, healthy people. It isn't a, a luxury, it's a necessity. And it is our responsibility to act collectively to give back to these struggling developing economies. You are here today, many of you. You work in the realm of parks because most likely you had some special place in nature that what you went to when you were a kid. It may have been along a beach, it may have been in the woods, it may have been on a stream, some special place that was yours, that you owned. I had such a sense of ownership of those woods that I pulled out, I think, as an eight-year-old, hundreds of survey stakes that I knew had something to do with the bulldozers that were taking out other woods and I think I held them off for a while. Um, I told that story a few years ago in, in Albuquerque, and then afterwards, uh, during the question and answer period, uh, a rancher stood up, and he was the real deal. His jeans had not been acid washed. And uh, he had thick plastic glasses and a handle, white handlebar mustache, and he was um, uh, uh, sunburned, et cetera. And he said, you know that story you told about pulling out survey stakes? And I said, yes, I thought I was in trouble. He looked very conservative. And he said, I did that as a boy. And then he began to cry in front of 500 people, half of whom were wearing cowboy hats. And despite his deep embarrassment, he continued to speak about his sense of grief that his might be one of the last generations to have that kind of sense of ownership of land. And it has nothing to do with money. If children are introduced to national parks when they're young, if they're introduced to the idea of caring for the environment when they're young, if they're introduced to uh, experiences in the natural world when they're young, they will demand that they be able to do that for the rest of their lives. I don't see how we can expect children to value nature and national parks if they've never had experience of them or in them. 
I'm particularly keen that we should get back to, um, with children, the importance of unstructured play in nature. Um, children need to be able to play in the mud, they need to be able to get dirty, they need to be able to be creative and undirected. They need to be safe, but they need to have, be able to take risks and find their own challenges. They need to be loved as well. <laughs> But I think that nature encompasses all of that. They can have such tremendous experiences and we need to make sure that we reconnect children to, to nature. The kids are not going outdoors very much anymore. Uh, and that has big implications for their health, their psychological health, their physical health. Whether or not we'll have very many good conservationists in the future, it has implications for that. Um, and it certainly has implications for the future parks. You know, we, we need a society in which we are as immersed in the natural world every day as we are in technology. We don't have that now. And uh, this is not a knock on, on technology, it's saying we're out of balance. Parks can play a huge role you know, in making sure people have a sense of, of balance. And that has everything to do with, with health. And so all over the world, city parks are breathing new life into once forgotten places on the earth. I'm looking forward to doing more at Beyond Blue with both the ideas that the speakers put forward but also the overall, overall mention and the overall message of the conference is very much how it is uh, thinking global, acting local. I'm delighted to be here and it's been quite, uh, I must say, quite enlightening to meet so many people from so many countries all sharing this great interest to do more healthy parks, healthy people. Um, globally to spread the Healthy Parks, Healthy People philosophy. I think it's conferences like this are very important because we're able to share ideas, experiences and build partnerships. And I think in building partnerships we'll be able to build a force for advocacy which will eventually affect the policy makers. As we close in the last few minutes of this Congress, I think we can just say again, show our appreciation for the immense amount of work that's taken place.